Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Photographic Gallery. And thank you for joining us today for the first of the series, Decolonize the Lens. Uh, this is a four-part series of discursive events with photographic experts and scholars who will look at the local history of photography in Egypt and Northeast Africa to consider ways to decolonize the imperial gaze. In each of the four webinars, one of the program's guest speakers speakers will present a different approach to rethinking the dominant narratives in the history of photography. Then we will open the floor for the Q&A with the audience. Decolonize the Lens is a re joint research project between faculty in journalism and mass communication and the history department and the photographic gallery. So before we start today's presentation and discussion, I'd like to briefly introduce the photographic gallery and my collaborators who will alternate moderating the discussions throughout the series, Ronnie Close and Dr. Mark Teets. Um, the Photographic Gallery was founded in 1991 as part of the Department of Journalism and Mass Communications of the School of, Ga of Global Affairs and Public Policy. Uh, the gallery is located in the new Cairo campus of the university and offers a public program of exhibitions, educational projects, workshops and talks around the academic year and showcases photography works by young emerging and established local and international photographers and students. Uh, Ronnie Close is an associate professor in the Department of Journalism and Mass Communications at the AUC. His research interests look at the relationship between aesthetics and politics and he has worked on a long-term project on the ultras football movements in Egypt, Brazil, and Palestine. Uh, through visual research projects, workshops, and written publications, he looks at the role of the image object in the contemporary world. Uh, Dr. Mark W. Dietz uh, is assistant professor of African and world history at the AUC. He is a social cultural historian of modern Africa with a research focus on the Senegambian region of West Africa in the 19th and 20th centuries. His research emerges from his diplomatic experience in Senegal, the Gambia, Guinea-Bissau, Mauritania, and Cape Verde. Uh, and his current book project, which is based on his 2017 dissertation at Cornell University, is a sociocultural history of the Casamance conflict in Southern Senegal, tentatively entitled A Country of Defiance, mapping the Casamance in Senegal. Uh, Mark's work has been published in History in Africa, the Journal of Asian and African Studies, the Oxford Research Encyclopedia of American History, and the blog site Af Africa is a Country. Uh, today's guest speaker, uh, Dr. Ziad Fahmi, is a professor of modern Middle East history at the Department of Near Eastern Studies at Cornell University. Uh, professor Fahmi is the author of Street Sounds, Listening to Everyday Life in Modern Egypt, published by Stanford University Press 2020, and Ordinary Egyptians, create, Creating the Modern Nation Through Popular cu Culture, also published by Stanford University Press 2011. His articles have appeared in Comparative Studies in Society and History, the International Journal of Middle East Studies, History Compass, and in Comparative Studies of South, South Asia, Africa, and the Middle East. Uh, and now, finally, before I give the floor to Mark, uh, I'd like to uh, thank the American University in Cairo for funding this program. Uh, now to Mark. All right, thank you, Dina. Yeah, thank you, Dina. Um, so welcome aboard to everybody for uh, what we hope and what we believe uh, will be a fascinating uh, historical and political discussion. In a moment, I'm gonna hand the microphone to my former advisor at Cornell, Ziad Fahmi. I am proud that along with Ziad, um, the, the chair of my dissertation uh, committee at Cornell, Judith Byfield, is also with us. But before I hand the mic to Ziad, I, I want to give you an idea of the format that we'll be using today. Um, since we are using Zoom's webinar format, you will only see the co-hosts and our guest speaker on your screens. 
you will not see the other audience members as we are more than 200 people today. However, you can still make comments and ask questions via the chat box throughout Ziad's uh, approximately 30 minute talk. Um, Ronnie and Dina will then uh, collect and collate your questions for me to pose to Ziad after his talk. Then Ziad can address the most popular questions since time is limited. So let's get started. For you photography enthusiasts, we will talk about photography more in the next few episodes, I promise. Um, but one of the first ways that we can think about uh, decolonizing the lens is by questioning the presence of the lens in the first place. How do we begin to picture the past differently if we listen to the past instead? How can we do that with sounds and silences that appear to be locked forever in the past? How can we resurrect them even from old photographs? To help us answer some of these questions, Ziad Fahmi is here to tell us about his latest book, Street Sounds, Listening to Everyday Life in Modern Egypt. Ziad, over to you. Thank you. Uh, just bear with me for a second as I uh, share my screen. Lots of photographs there. <laughs> and there we go. <clears throat> All right, uh, first uh, I'd like to thank uh, AUC and professors uh, Mark Dietz, uh, Ronnie Close and Dean al for inviting me uh, to present this paper. Um, and uh, thank you all for, for attending. Uh, I know all too well about Zoom fatigue uh, in this uh, age of COVID-19. Uh, so thank you for joining me for this lecture. The specific title for this uh, presentation is actually Working in the Streets, Silencing Cairo Street Hawkers. Uh, this paper is taken from my recently published book, um, as you can see there, Street Sounds, Listening to Everyday uh, Life in Modern Egypt. Uh, but before I delve into the paper, I'd like to sort of briefly give you uh, an overview uh, of the book so you can get a sense of where this presentation uh, fits in in my larger project. Um, and of course, you can see right there, uh, chapter by chapter, what the different chapters are on. Uh, the presentation today is mainly uh, on uh, uh, taken from part from chapter two. And um, if you have any questions on some of these other chapters, we can talk about them at the end if, if there's time. Uh, so in the book, I examine everyday life in Egypt uh, using sound and, and what I call the politics of sound as one of the key tools for uh, uncovering the changes uh, that went on in the Egyptian streets uh, during the first half of the 20th century. I argue that by listening in uh, to these to these uh, street changes, uh, we can get a, a lot closer to the embodied realities uh, of everyday life. This, I argue, allows for a, a more microhistorical uh, examination of everyday people's interactions with each other and helps us evaluate uh, the impact uh, of the various street level technological and infrastructural changes taking place at the turn of the 20th century uh, and beyond. Historians um, have recently started uh, listening to the past, contributing to what David Hose describes as, and I quote, a sensorial revolution in the humanities and social sciences. In the same way that all five senses are relevant to uh, our daily understanding of the world around us, they should be vital to our understanding of historical events. Examining the changing soundscapes of the past and interpreting how people sonically experience their world makes it uh, possible a richer, uh, more comprehensive, micro-level grasp of everyday life. As this uh, present, uh, presentation will reveal, by listening in to the sources, historians can get a little closer to the mundane realities uh, taking place in the streets, revealing a great deal about how ordinary people uh, dealt with modernity and uh, it, the encroaching state authority as well. So this embodied micro-historical approach can also uncover uh, everyday men and women's daily struggles to make a living uh, through their use and misuse of the public streets. As I hope to demonstrate, there is much to be discovered by incorporating sounds and soundscapes 
uh, into our methodological toolkit. But before we continue our discussion, we must address some common misconceptions about the nature of sound and its suitability for historical study. For contemporary events, uh, or for many historical events that occurred in the second half of the 20th century, sound and audiovisual recordings, of course, are available for examination. But how can researchers fill in this sensory gap when writing about historical periods before the invention of recording technology? The obvious solution uh, to this problem can be found in the same texts and photographs, I, I could add, uh, that historians have been using all along. Or as uh, R. Murray Schaefer has eloquently stated, historians will have to turn to ear witness accounts. This fact that uh, historians silently read texts in the archives does not mean that the original writers were only depicting visual observations. People acquire content, meaning, and information from their physical environment using all five senses. Lest we forget, the very act of writing is as much tactile as it is visual. And the information being conveyed will no doubt be full of embodied multi-sensory content. Although uh, this next point may seem counterintuitive at first, photographs and other images also do not uh, relay only visual information. They can be full of other sensory information as well, and can convey critical information about past sounds and soundscapes. Almost in the same way that texts are full of auditory data, so are images and photographs. And if read critically, and along with supporting documentation, they can be as useful uh, in reimagining some of the lost soundscapes of the past. Uh, we could talk a little bit more about this in, in the Q&A, um, and, um, uh, and I'll be happy to answer some of your questions. So by attuning ourselves uh, to the sounds described within the text, we can perceive the perspective that the original author has conveyed regarding the sounds, noises, and words that they may have heard. Also, writers don't just record what they have seen and heard, depending on the events they are covering uh, and the context of the document they are writing, they can also detail olfactory, tactile, and gustatory information. Each historical time and locale as their varied natural, uh, animal, human, and technological sounds that play an important role uh, in defining the place to its inhabitants. These sounds have an assortment of economic, environmental, social, and cultural implications, uh, which are vital to a well-rounded uh, understanding of the past. In Egypt, uh, coffee shops were, and of course continue to be uh, an extension of the streets in that their spatial and their sonic boundaries usually expand beyond their officially enclosed space. Whether permitting uh, most Egyptian cafes sat more people outside on the sidewalks than inside with obvious sonic implications for the neighborhood uh, that surrounds them. This meant that passersby, be they paper boys, street vendors, entertainers, or simply pedestrians uh, could observe and listen to if not participate in the coffee shop experience. As newer, louder technologies such as gramophones and radios were introduced, uh, the acoustic imprints of cafes must have dramatically increased as well. Commercial activity was and still is, of course, loudly conducted in the sidewalks of these cafes as dozens of street hawkers uh, took advantage of the already seated clientele. And of course, this photograph depicts this quite well. Street hawkers uh, did not just sell their goods near the market uh, or to coffee shop customers. As new institutions like theaters, cinemas, and uh, train and tram stations were introduced, vendors followed with their wares and loud calls. Tramways themselves often served as ready-made moving platforms for hawkers to make a sale. Electric tramways were not just vehicles for uh, transporting people. They also created their own embodied social and economic space, allowing for uh, direct and indirect sociability and economic interaction across gender, culture, and class lines. Tramways were not hermetically sealed capsules uh, and sensitive perception and engagement with the streets was ongoing for all passengers, especially those uh, sitting or standing near the open doors and windows. In fact, most carrying trams, as you can see from these pictures at that time, uh, save for a little metal uh, side rail, were entirely open to the streets. Not only were the cheapest tramway tickets affordable, but by avoiding the conductor altogether, many could easily use the tram without paying a penny. This was frequently done by children, students, and street merchants who can easily climb in and out 
or simply hang on to the outside of the tram. In fact, the line between a pedestrian and tram rider was not always clear as it was easy for, for both paying and non-paying passengers to go in and out of the tram uh, when it stopped in traffic or when it was moving, of course, at slow speeds. And there's plenty of accounts of this in the historical record. Uh, multilingual signs in, in Arabic, uh, English, French, and Greek uh, were posted uh, on, the, on the trams, forbidding passengers from riding on the trams footboard. Uh, these signs were rarely obeyed in practice as footboards were always in use uh, by passengers. When the tram was overcrowded and also by what I call uh, tram surfers uh, who latched onto the outside to avoid the fare. Newspaper boys, uh, shoe blacks and trinket sellers uh, also relied on, on the footboards for jumping on and off uh, the moving tram at will. This sort of uh, tram surfing uh, was very common in Egypt as uh, this 1918 account confirms, and I quote, if the regulations about riding on footboards were enforced, the hawkers of meats, drinks, and knickknacks would not plague you with their constant solicitation. The boot boys carry on their trade furtively between the seats. Often they ride for a, for a mile, working hard on a half dozen boots. The police, of course, attempted to limit tram surfing. Uh, and in 1921, uh, just in the Abdin district of Cairo alone, there were 731 citations that were given for illegal tram uh, riding. However, by all accounts, this was just a drop in the bucket and did little to discourage the practice. For example, uh, an American couple living in Egypt in 1955 remarked, and I quote, we were able to spend many enjoyable hours exploring the city. These journeys were usually made by tram, the most exciting experience as the majority of Cairo trams are open at either side and travel so slowly that peddlers can come and go at will, even when the tram is in motion. So public transportation uh, and trams in particular provided a moving platform for riders to talk, buy, sell, and engage in a variety of social economic interactions. As a physically uh, moving space, that outsiders can enter and exit with ease, tramways are neither private nor entirely public. In many ways, tram surfing illustrates the relative liminality of the tram as a new modern space, which on a daily basis allowed for embodied and loud interaction. Moreover, the use and misuse of the trams by paying and non-paying passengers, street hawkers, and even pickpockets uh, indicates that trams were for the most part uh, almost uh, entirely appropriated by the urban residents for their own use, going well beyond their intended uh, use as basic uh, transportation. This is, I guess, a good example of how you can read sound from, from photographs. <clears throat> and again, we'll, we can talk a little bit more about that later. <clears throat> Street hawkers had uh, regular routes in most urban residential neighborhoods. The loudness and pitch of their calls were essential to reaching inside the homes of their customers. It was more than just the actual words being sounded. Uh, it was the unique inflection, tone, and pitch of a particular seller's voice that signaled from a distance the exact product being sold. The astute listener would then approximate the distance and time of the hawker's arrival, uh, giving them, of course, ample time to you know, walk down the stairs and conduct the transaction. For smaller items, the customers didn't need to descend to the streets. Uh, most uh, households had handy wicker baskets attached to long ropes, which they could send down cash and bring up to purchase goods. Uh, in those scenarios, both the buyers, who were predominantly women, and the sellers shouted the details of the transactions for all to hear. Um, I mean, you can see the basket on, on the image uh, on, on the right, right there. Building walls uh, may visually, of course, create a partition separating private from public. Uh, but at the time, most walls could hardly stop sound from traveling through. Windows, balconies, and doors enhanced the sonic penetration and served as sensory portals connecting residents with their neighbors and their neighborhood. Uh, there was little sound insulation in walls in late 19th to mid 20th century houses and uh, uh, residences in poorer districts did not have glass windows uh, to even slightly buffer against street sounds. 
road noises, and even loud conversations were easily heard inside houses and apartments. In most cases, that was not necessarily undesirable, as connecting with your neighbors and interacting with street hawkers was not only convenient, uh, but the expected norm. Windows, balconies, and rooftops had the potential to, be to become, yet again, sort of liminal zones that were neither private nor public, especially when they were actively used as platforms for social uh, and economic engagement. The mere presence of hawkers in the streets in significant numbers created uh, regular spheres of physical interaction and conversation with pedestrians, other vendors, store owners, and even residents who had their windows uh, or doors open. The more one sort of listens to these uh, interactions, the more it becomes apparent that the public versus private sphere split was never as rigid as theorized. For instance, Mary Waitley, a longtime resident of late 19th century Cairo, wrote that she often heard through her window her neighbors talking to each other and to street merchants. Waitley's uh, next door neighbor, for example, who regularly sat on her reed mat selling sugar canes in the street's corner next to her window, and I quote, talked incessantly to anyone who came within earshot, whether customer or not. Waitley uh, also vividly describes uh, how in the late afternoons, when the street merchants were closing up their accounts, she would regularly hear, and I quote again, a few sharp bargainers trying to get oranges, beans, etc., at a lower rate than before. The clatter of tongues was quite astonishing. Waitley could uh, clearly he uh, hear these conversations from her window, of course. So windows, doors, rooftops, and balconies were uh, directly, uh, directly focused uh, the auditory and, of course, sometimes the visual interaction between those who are partly on the inside, yet still engage uh, in varying degrees uh, with their neighbors uh, and street hawkers on the outside, uh, providing liminal spaces for direct sensory interactions that were neither entirely public uh, nor entirely private. In, uh, in Egypt, in Egypt, a, a significant number of the street hawkers uh, were, were women. In fact, many late 19th and early 20th century observers uh, have noted a somewhat gendered division of labor among the male and female street hawkers. Uh, Mary Waitley, who in the 1860s and 70s uh, lived in the Kairin district of Bab al-Bah, remarked that Egyptian women typically sold milk, clotted cream, yogurt, oranges, radishes, uh, grilled corn, sugarcane, and other fresh produce. In, in 1902, Muhammad Omar corroborates uh, and expand on Waitley's assessment by stating uh, that men specialize in selling, and I quote, matches, books, shoes, sweets, clothing, pistachios, paparga, matarik, for all the Egyptians out there, uh, textiles, cheese, breadsticks, uh, newspaper, uh, newspapers, peanuts, oil, whistles, bracelets, pottery, and everything for a penny. Uh, women, according to Omar, sold, and I quote, flowers, textiles, rose water, dates, milk, honey, ghee, oranges, dates, and corn. Uh, this observed division of labor between male and female street merchants was not hard and fast, uh, as I found plenty of evidence uh, of women selling jewelry and cheese. The top left uh, uh, photograph actually depicts uh, uh, peasant women uh, selling uh, farmer's cheese, mish and given arish, I suppose. In any case, uh, there's no evidence of any official or social mechanism that really that specifically forbade female vendors uh, from selling a particular product, at least as far as I know. Uh, up to the first half of the 20th century, uh, the number and variety of calls from street merchants dwarfed what they are today. A contemporary observer in mid 1930s Cairo documented 165 distinct calls by street hawkers. Uh, and that was just for food sellers. The merchants loudly and melodically emphasized the freshness, ripeness, taste, size, or geographic origins of the foods that they were selling. Comparisons, uh, often amusing or exaggerated, uh, were sometimes used to drive the point home to buyers. Tomatoes, for example, uh, could be the size of pomegranates or as red as roses. Uh, because Egyptians preferred uh, small cucumbers, uh, they were often likened to kidney beans. Some uh, declared that their dates were as good as lamb, uh, and pistachio sellers uh, uh, compared their products to grilled quail, and sellers of barbecue corn uh, announced uh, that their corn was as tasty as roasted chicken. Uh, 
if the tenderness of the food was important, then the sellers loudly chanted, even the toothless can eat them. Upon seeing a, a child uh, playing in the streets, uh, candy vendors would yell out, Ayat lom makyawed, or cry to your mother, little boy, uh, urging young children uh, to beg their mothers for candy. There were dozens of non-vocal auditory cues used by vendors uh, selling candy and, and other sweets to children. Writing about his childhood uh, during uh, the late 1910s in Cairo's Sayyid Zainab district, Fathir al uh, vividly remembers many of these distinct calls and sounds. He recalls how uh, the seller of a traditional caramel uh, had the long uh, piece of a toffee-like candy attached to a long pole uh, with a rattle uh, at the end of it. This is actually an image of a, of a similar seller, but in an Egyptian village as opposed to in, in Cairo. Uh, you can see the stick right there and right on the top of it, that little can uh, has probably some uh, rocks in it that would, that would rattle as he would shake it. According uh, to Radwan, <clears throat> when the vendor shook the pole, and I quote, it produced a loud, irresistible rattling sound that drove all neighboring children crazy as they came out of the woodwork with their pennies in hand. Radwan also recalls uh, a vendor selling vanilla wafers uh, who employed a variety of sonic tools to advertise his arrival. He not only, and I quote, blew, blew on a small horn, but made a loud crackling sound by beating two pieces of wood against each other. And for good measure, he sometimes uh, shouted, Pascot Vanilla or vanilla, crackers, uh, vanilla cookies uh, for all to hear. Butane uh, tank merchants, who are still heard throughout Egypt, uh, could signal their arrival to an entire neighborhood without uttering a single word. Striking their metal butane cylinders uh, with a wrench, they produced a familiar loud and rhythmic clanking that sonically carried for several city blocks. Lemonade, sherbet, uh, and juice sellers rhythmically, uh, uh, rhythmically clanked their, their large sort of castanet like brass saucers to advertise their cold drinks. Uh, during uh, the summer, cold drink sellers and their clanking sounds were prevalent in the traditional districts of Cairo well into uh, the mid 20th century. Perhaps the earliest sounded film uh, recording of one of these drink sellers was captured in the winter of 1928 in the raw footage of a newsreel by the Fox uh, Movie Tone Company. A licorice uh, juice seller surrounded by a mass of people uh, in Cairo's at Hussein district performed in front of the camera while clanking his brass saucers uh, for close to 20 seconds. I will play a few of those seconds for you now. If you do have uh, headphones, it might be easy, uh, better to hear. <laughs> I would uh, play you a little bit more, but we're, uh, we're short on time. Um, in, in part because of the, the transitory nature of the street hawkers, their relationship with, uh, with the Egyptian state was and still is rife with tension. Unsuccessful attempts at regulating, documenting, and taxing them began in the mid 19th century and continue to this day. These regulations attempted not only to dictate where and when these merchants would sell their wares, but also they attempt to control their hygiene, the volume of their calls, uh, and they try to dictate what time of day they can loudly advertise their merchandise. For example, on paper at least, street hawkers were not allowed to make their calls after sunset, and during the summer, uh, they were forbidden to sell their goods during siesta time from 2 p.m. to, to 4 p.m. It's important to note that the vast majority of street hawkers were unregulated. And though these laws were on the books, they were unevenly enforced. Just like uh, today, police abuse of street merchants was common. As dozens of petitioners to the Egyptian government in the 1930s and 40s attest, police beatings, arrests, and embezzling money from unlicensed merchants was common. Uh, when placed uh, under arrest, the most common offense was obstructing traffic. In uh, an October 16, 1944 petition to uh, King Farouk, Abdel Maqsoud Khalaf Hassan, the self-proclaimed president of the Public 
union of knickknack peddlers declares, and I quote, the police are constantly harassing and chasing after us in the streets and alleyways as if we were criminals running from justice. The truth is that we're merely trying to make an honest living. We are without any rights. We endure daily toil and suffer backbreaking work just to barely make ends meet. The doors to other professions are closed shut for us. This is the only means for our livelihood and it is honest work. We work in the coldest of winter nights and the hottest of summer days. We sell sunglasses, pens, and knickknacks, uh, which are all very small and light. We certainly do not cause any traffic obstruction as is often claimed by the police. After making his case, uh, Hassan then proceeds to lay out three basic demands from the government. Stop chasing after and arresting street hawkers, reform the current laws, facilitate the attainment of street hawker licenses. Not surprisingly, uh, none of these demands were met as three years later, yet another petition was filed complaining uh, of the exact same uh, police abuses. These, uh, uh, this new petition was dated uh, March 27, 1947, uh, and asked the government to recognize and license more street hawkers in order to legitimate their economic activity. Uh, these two peti petitions and many others like them uh, suggest that the laws concerning street hawkers were only partly enforced. Uh, so even though, according to state regulations, street merchants were uh, supported, was supposed to have licenses, few of those licenses were given out as they were difficult to obtain. These uh, uneven and often unsuccessful efforts by the police to silence and restrict the activities of street merchants continue till this day. Street hawkers uh, still thrive in Egyptian streets and their voices continue to be heard. I want to <clears throat> begin my conclusion by reading you a quote from Michel de Certeau's The Practice of Everyday Life. The ordinary practitioner of the city live down below, below the threshold at which visibility begins. They walk, an elementary form of experiencing the city. They are walkers whose bodies follow the thicks and thins of an urban text, which they write without being able to read it. These practitioners, make use of spaces that cannot be seen. Their knowledge of them is as blind as that of lovers in each other's arms. The Certeau's depiction of life down below in the street level uh, captures an embodied extra visual sensory knowledge that ordinary urban dwellers have of their immediate environment. To a city resident, there is an innate sensory familiarity to a neighborhood street supplementing known sights with equally familiar pleasant or unpleasant sounds, smells, and tastes. Even the touch and feel of specific dips, curves, and cracks in the streets and sidewalks become intimately and blindly familiar to pedestrians as they daily take the same route to work, school, or the market. The Sertosan insistence on the importance of walking the city is in effect urging a multi-sensory understanding of space. By literally or figuratively walking in the streets, one can move beyond the watchful gaze of the state or beyond the two-dimensional uh, plans and maps uh, that were drawn out and put into place by state bureaucrats. As I demonstrated uh, in this talk, by moving closer and listening into street life, we can partly reveal how people live their everyday lives and more importantly, clarify how they dealt with state authorities in their mundane struggles over the use and ownership of the streets. Compared to other approaches, the sensory approach is also more embodied and intimate as it sheds more light on how ordinary people adapted to the plethora of modernizing changes taking place during the first half of the 20th century. The Egyptian streets were not only a living, breathing laboratory for rapidly unfolding infrastructural and technological changes, but also it was one of the few places where most elements of society could potentially at least interact face to face. I focused on Egyptians who made a living in the streets, from pedestrians and tram riders to merchants and street hawkers, all of whom, of course, left their sonic imprints in the archives. Walking through and using and misusing the city street is in itself an act of, of appropriation, as pedestrians sensorily project their presence. People take ownership of the streets when they use them, whether they are uh, simply uh, walking through, sitting in an outdoor cafe, or selling their goods in the city's squares and roads. As we examine these embodied possessions of public spaces, we're not always uncontested. 
The police and the political authorities always attempt to limit, control, and regulate the use of public roads. However, uh, the panoptic powers of the modern state were never as neat, efficient, and controlling as they are sometimes portrayed. Everyday people uh, daily used and misused the streets for their own purposes to loudly buy, sell, mourn, and celebrate, often breaking a host of state regulations in the process. Street hawkers in particular, uh, as we've seen, frequently petitioned uh, the state to address their grievances, while countless other men and women adapted to all the rapid structural and technological changes by appropriating the very streets and technologies as their own. Ordinary uh, pedestrians, beggars, commuters, paying and non-paying tram passengers, street vendors, and even pickpockets used and misused the electric trams, buses, streets, and sidewalks for their own purposes, which effectively allowed them to lay claim to the streets and adapt the very infrastructure of modernity for their own use. There are many more historical dimensions uh, to be discovered if we are open to considering sound as a serious path of inquiry for understanding the past. Sound historian Jonathan Stern accurately declared, and I quote, that there is always more than one map of a territory and sound provides a particular path through history. By finding uh, and interpreting new auditory data, historians add new sensory dimensions to their historical analysis, transforming how we understand the past. So as the growing uh, field of sound studies has shown, comprehending the daily experiences of ordinary people requires us to listen more to the past. Thank you all very much. Let me get out of the screen. All right, Ziad, uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we're having uh, reactions uh, in the chat box uh, already. Um, so we've had uh, one question um, already uh, about your sources um, and about the sources of some of these photos and videos, not necessarily the individual names, but um, uh, Clara Stratman wonders uh, if you could tell us, you know, were, the, were these native, um, the, who, who took these photos and videos? Um, were they uh, native Egyptians? Were they European visitors? So on and so forth. Yeah, uh, I mean, I'll, I'll first uh, broadly talk about the, the sources, because typically, uh, at least for historians, there's often this gap of uh, trying to imagine how would you uh, arrive at some of the sensory data and, and what was happening sonically by just look, looking at text. And predominantly for my research, I relied mainly on text and, ar and archival information. Um, um, Basically, like any, any form of text uh, that's, that's been written down um, always has multi-sensory information in it. And, and often we assume that it's, it's mainly just visual. Um, but sonic information and other sensory information, in fact, is, is, is quite ubiquitous. I mean, if we imagine uh, when we're writing emails or, or, or read over some of the emails that we receive from, from colleagues and friends and so forth, um, um, you know, people perceive their world around them in a multi-sensory way. Um, and often when they're writing it down, they depict those senses there. And so if we attune them ourselves to this, um, we can pick up on a lot of those sensory information. As far as the, uh, uh, most of the photographs that I used here were more to sort of, I didn't use them necessarily for, for my research. They're more sort of to illustrate uh, uh, this particular talk and to show that for some of them, uh, uh, um, they can sort of indicate some of those uh, 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 sonic information. Um, I think the, for historians, they have to always interrogate these photographs and find out a little bit more about first, you know, who took the photograph? Is it a studio sh is shot or not? Is it, was it posed uh, or was it a sort of a snapshot take, taken in the streets? Um, or was it for, for most of the sources that I use, at least in, in the book, uh, there were uh, newspaper photographs taken by uh, uh, you know, La Haram newspaper and, and, and a bunch of other magazines and, and newspapers. Um, and yet still, there are almost always, uh, um, there's, a, there's something behind it. There's a, you know, either political intent or, or something else that is sort of behind it. Um, and the argument that I make in the book, which I didn't have time to talk about here, is that I use this to examine uh, a middle-class formation in particular. Uh, and, and most often, many of those uh, newspaper photographs uh, were, were laid out in, in such a way 
uh, to marginalize uh, people who are working in the streets in a way in order to deflect and to define what this new uh, urban middle class as it, as it was forming vis-a-vis forming -vis the urban masses. Uh, and you know, they're, they're all obviously have different sources. The movie itself that I showed a short clip of, um, what made it slightly more valuable was the fact that it was raw footage. Um, and I don't even know, uh, I tried to investigate this, but I didn't have the time to do so, uh, whether it was turned into an actual documentary, but it was raw footage done by the Fox Movie Tone Company. Uh, hmm. And uh, the actual footage is available at the University of South Carolina. Um, but uh, hmm. it was it was hodgepodge footing throughout uh, different parts of Egypt. Of course, uh, uh, that raw footage did not inc only include parts of the traditional urban quarters of Cairo. Uh, it didn't in include uh, uh, Azbekeya, for example, or other parts of downtown Cairo that were a lot more modern because it was it, it was trying to pick the, the traditions of uh, or tr the traditional areas per se. Uh, had the same uh, crew went and filmed elsewhere, it would have been completely different as far as the sounds and, and the peoples that were depicted in the streets, et cetera. Et cetera. I could go on forever, so I'll, I'll yeah. stop here. <laughs> no, it's good stuff, uh, Ziad. You, you uh, in in your introduction to to the book, you talked about uh, you know how Deserto uh, kind of gave you this uh, sense of kind of like a history of movement and uh, walking through the streets of downtown Cairo. Um, Alex uh, Segerman, assistant professor of art history at Rutgers. Uh, has written, you used photographs to discover more about sounds. So I was wondering if we could think about the reverse. How did these street sounds then impact the arts in music, painting, uh, literature, or film? Very good question. Um, I, I talk, surprisingly, I talk more about this in my first book because I focus on popular culture. Uh, but uh, in the conclusion of this particular book, I use some examples of, of the reverse. Um, and um, um, I mean, going back at least to, to my first project, um, Said Darwish uh, and, 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 and other musicians in, in early 20th century Egypt, especially, especially Said Darwish, uh, were very good at uh, sort of mining the streets for for inspiration and information and including some of those sounds or at least the way that they, that they mediated some of those sounds into their music. Um, not just the, the, the musicality of, of some of these stones in, in the streets but also sometimes even the, 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 the words and the verbalizations themselves. Uh, he has quite a few songs, for example, that actually uh, contain some of these street hawker calls. Um, so uh, there's always, it's always going to be a two way street um, and, and when it comes to uh, uh, how artists are, are inspired and how art inspires the street. Uh, because some of these songs, for example, were also sung in, in the streets on a variety of different occasions, whether in the 1919 revolution or elsewhere. Uh, so there's always this, this dialogue. It's always dialectical back and forth. Uh, and, and, um, and, and that's, what, that's what makes it interesting, at least, at least to me. So. Yeah. Uh, Ziad, what, um, what led to this project for you? How did you become interested in sound history? Um, it was, a. Uh, it started out, I suppose, with, with my first book, because I focused on, on Ameya or the Egyptian vernacular, uh, and popular culture, uh, music, uh, music recordings, the theater, and so forth. I became more aware of the importance of, of orality and sound. Orality spelled with an O, but also the orality with an A-U. Um, and I started thinking about it, you know, back then, and I was, as I was revising uh, that book, um, I added a, a, a bit on, on, on sound studies, but it was it felt really rushed and I wanted to have a project uh, from the very beginnings of it, where the entire focus, excuse the, 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 the bad use of, of the word there, was on sound. Um, and luckily for me at the Society of Humanities at Cornell, uh, the, the theme uh, for, uh, uh, for uh, the Society of Humanities for in, 19, in, uh, 19, in 2012, uh, was on sounds and soundscapes. And for the entire year, uh, basically, uh, there were a group of, of, of a dozen scholars uh, from across the world and, 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 and that essentially were, were uh, specialists uh, uh, on, on sounds and soundscapes and from a variety of different disciplines. There were ethnomusicologists, uh, uh, anth anthropologists, and, and so forth. I think I was the only historian uh, at the time. And that was very fruitful and it really introduced me to the field of sound studies from a variety of, of different disciplines. Um, and, and so uh, I read more on that, on that literature um, and, and the idea coalesced a little bit more in my mind to sort of write an entire book on sound. 
And as much as possible, unlike in the first book, uh, the focus was really on the streets. Uh, and I try to, as much as possible, to stay away from, from mediated sources and, and, and media. Uh, though in, and the next project will be on radio that sort of will connect back to, to the first book. Okay, great, great. Um, so what one of our audience members has asked, uh, how would you relate your highly forensic approach to photographic evidence to Tina Kemp's suggestion that we listen to photos? And uh, Ariella Azule is urging that we watch rather than look at photos. Um, do, you, do you feel that these projects are similar to yours or are they very different? Um, I, honestly, I'm not, I'm not as familiar with, with those uh, specific uh, uh, scholarly works, um, um, mainly because the, the book itself was mainly focused on, on text per se. Uh, but just, but the, the way that I, I look at photographs for this particular project, uh, what I try to do is, 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 is listen to them in a way. Um, again, you still have to interrogate them and be very critical. And, and, and as a historian, use my own uh, sort of historical lens to uh, break down and read against the grain of sort of, you know, you know, what these photographs are about, you know, why are they useful, but I always use them uh, sort of as corroborating evidence along with, with the textual sources. Um, I'm not really a, a historian of the visual images and, and, and that's not my forte. Um, and so I cautiously stay close to my craft, but at the same time, I always try to be as multidisciplinary as possible. Um, but uh, thank you for, uh, uh, for talking about some of these other scholars and I need to uh, uh, look them up, especially in future projects, if I get back to the, to the visual image somewhat again. So with radio, that, there's going to be a lot less of that. So with my next project, yeah, that that um, that last question was uh, from Chris Penny, um, uh, who I know Ronnie has talked about doing a a, a lot of work um, on this as well. Um, so as uh, this one coming from uh, Zena Doadar, uh, as sound is so easily stored and recorded now. It is difficult to think about how historically sound has been treated in terms of a, a method of recording history or archiving. Um, are there, for instance, any instances of archivists working with early recording companies in Egypt, such as a body phone or a Cairo phone, uh, et cetera, to, to record regular sounds for the sole purpose of uh, archiving them? So was recording sound either through audio or earlier on text seen as valuable or important for historical records? I think it should be. Um, and as far as I know, there aren't any uh, official archives that do this sort of work. Informally, a lot of hobbyists um, throughout the on, on YouTube and other places are uh, haphazardly uh, preserving some of this material. Um, but um, you, you may find some uh, uh, random recordings uh, here and there in, in some archives, but there isn't really, as far as I know, a collective effort to be able to do that. Uh, um, especially uh, recordings of um, sort of everyday life in a way. When it comes to recordings of, of, of music and phonograph records and, and so forth, um, again, it's all over the place. Um, uh, so in, uh, very few people are able to use them, but supposedly in the 10th floor of the radio and television building, uh, they do have some uh, archived recordings of some of the earlier uh, uh, period in Egyptian radio and, and television, but a lot of it is very uh, 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 poorly kept and re-recorded. Uh, and so, uh, and very few scholars that I know could actually have access to it. Uh, there are ways to, as far as the, some of the uh, early phonograph uh, record companies, many of them were multinational. Um, and so, uh, I had one of my one of my students uh, was able to access the archives of EMI Records uh, near London, uh, and they had bought and incorporated a lot of the smaller phonograph record companies uh, that were uh, in Egypt um, uh, during the early parts of the 20th century. Um, and so um, they don't have as they have some of those recordings, but they also have a, a, a robust uh, uh, textual archives of many of the catalogs and, and so forth. Uh, so. They're out there, but you have to you have to look and hunt them down and, and, and find them out um, a little bit a little bit further. Um, and uh, 
there isn't really among historians sort of that, that ethos of, of actually really focusing on sound as much as they should. Um, and, and archivists are beginning to, to, to do that type of work. So. Okay. Um, so there's a, a couple of questions that we've had, um, Ziad. Um, you know, in, in your book, you talk about the, the role of the state in, uh, in controlling and surveilling uh, the, the population and things like that. Um, we've had uh, one question about the call to prayer uh, that's kind of come up a, a couple of times. And uh, I know that you address this uh, some in your book and, and kind of how the call to prayer changed over time. So maybe you could talk a little bit about that. And then uh, another question uh, coming from uh, Mike Reimer in uh, the history department here at AUC, um, that when you talked about street merchants and the police, he was thinking of uh, Mohammed uh, Bouazizi and his confrontation with the police and kind of the extraordinary uh, consequences. So uh, could you comment on those two things for us? Uh, yes. Um, what, was, what was the first question again, quickly? The first question was about the call to prayer. Oh, that's right. Um, in, in Egypt, uh, in particular, there, there, there wasn't that much uh, of a big, as far as I can tell from reading the, the press at the time, uh, there wasn't a huge controversy over the, the beginnings of its, of its use through uh, uh, using loudspeakers. And it happened in, in, the in the 1940s, but first it was only the very large congregational mosques um, that, that used them. Uh, and then eventually by the 1950s, uh, other, other uh, uh, smaller mosques began to, began to install them and, and use them as well. Um, and loudspeakers um, initially also, uh, they were first used by the state and eventually everyday people began to use them as well in, in weddings and funerals and so forth. So it was sort of a, there was a bit of a transition there. The technology was there in the 1930s, but I didn't find evidence that uh, the call to prayer was uh, broadcast on loudspeakers in, until, until the 40s. Um, as far as uh, 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 Michael Raymer's question first, hi Mike, uh, it's, been, it's been a while. Um, uh, and absolutely, there, there's that contestation between uh, the, street and, uh, the, the, the state and street merchants. It's something um, that is very much ongoing in, in Egypt as, as I talked about. Um, and um, these particular moments, of course, where, uh, you know, which led to uh, these with Boazizi and, 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 uh, and, and, and the Tunisian uh, revolt and revolution um, could really probably only happen in that way, in my opinion, uh, in, in, the, in this day and age where, where uh, 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 mediated technology was able to spread that particular event uh, beyond the small locale. Uh, and and uh, it was definitely a useful uh, uh, calling cry for many of the revolutionaries because it resonated and, and only resonated because a lot of people know someone that's been abused that way by, by the police. And that gives it sort of a, a, a stronger emotional appeal to it. And if it happens in a particular right moment in time, uh, it, can, it can lead to uh, a, broader, a broader social media. Okay, thank you. Um, one of our audience members uh, asked, is there any documentation about Gawazi dancers or street dancing um, and the regulation of dancing bodies? Uh, did you find any, uh, any sources about that? Surprisingly, I, I didn't find any uh, as far as dancing per se, mainly it was uh, dealt with, with, with noise and, and disruption. Um, they were, that definitely took place and there's wide documentation of, of where it took place and especially in particular events and, and weddings and, and street processions and, and mawalid and so forth. Um, but uh, uh, typically the regulations themselves uh, when, it, when it comes to entertainment um, were, were mainly focused on, on noise, uh, less, less so the visual. Uh, when it comes to street hawkers, it, it was more multi-sensory in that, especially those that were selling food uh, the, the smell and, and expiration date of the, of the food and, and, and whether it's safe or not was part of the conversation as well, in addition to uh, uh, the sound. Uh, but there wasn't as much sort of a, um, that I could find at least, sort of a, a way to sort of regulate at least the, the, the visual aspect of it. Um, or even the broad embodied aspect of it. It was more about noise at a particular time of, of the day. Uh, when it comes to uh, 
other accounts, newspaper accounts, there were plenty of, of critics, uh, uh, depending on, on the type of newspapers and the ones they were talking about. And, and they would talk about the, the visual aspects of it. So. Okay. Um, so we, we have a question from uh, Amico Stock, who's actually uh, at Cornell right now, but coming to AUC um, uh, to come to our anthropology department. Uh, I'm excited. Wow. Okay. Uh, she asks, how useful did you find official state or city archives, such as rulings or court records, uh, to be in such work? On one hand, I could imagine them highlighting the kind of sounds that were allowed in the making of the, the modernity and the identity of the place. On the other hand, I could see how they could be uh, missing the mark. So just curious to see how one might go about them? Yes. Um, well, there, there's sort of, broadly speaking, as far as the, the government archives, I, I use both the, the British archives and the and Egyptian archives. Um, and there's two ways of, of uh, two types of sources that I found useful. Um, one was the sort of the rules and regulations and how they're laid out um, and discussions concerning this. And they're mainly con uh, concerned about uh, unlawful sound and noise. Not in, they never really talk about what was, you know, what should be lawful or not. Uh, the other type of sources within those archives are petitions uh, and petitions from everyday people to, to the state. And these you can, you can see a little bit more. There's always a, a, a grievance, obviously. Uh, um, and, and often it was about, uh, we need to be allowed to, to have this, this celebration of, of, uh, of the Saints Festival uh, in this particular town and so forth. And, and we, have to ha we want to have those, uh, the regulations to be able to do that or uh, have this large wedding in that particular uh, district and so forth. Um, so, uh, so in a way, you, you always, I can always find use for them as long as sort of I, I frame them in, 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 in a particular, in a critical way, uh, manner. So. Well, thank you so much, uh, Ziad. It's been such a pleasure uh, having you join us. G great to see you again. I'm going to turn it back over to uh, Ronnie Close. I think he's got one final question and then uh, a final announcement. Okay. Um, okay, hi uh, Ziad. I just have a really short, simple question that actually came in earlier, got a bit lost in the question turmoil. Um, it was about the Beccia cellars, and I'm just wondering <laughs> what the what the origin of that that sound is. Like, where, where does that kind of come from, and how yeah. they sit within the kind of hierarchy of um, street vendors and uh, workers? Yes. Uh, well, that's. It's one of, the, I guess, the, the sounds that, that uh, certainly remains uh, in, in Egypt. And uh, I heard it everywhere, really, in Cairo and, and, and Alexandria. Uh, and originally, it's actually, it comes from the Italian. Um, and, uh, uh, and originally, uh, I would as assume that many uh, of, of uh, the Italians live, and there were tens of thousands of Italians living in Alexandria and Cairo, worked in the garment industry, most likely. Um, and, and, and also, potentially, you know, Bicchia sellers as well. And, it, and uh, the root of it is, uh, in Italian, is, is, is roba vicchia, and literally old clothes or old things. Uh, but of course, that's sort of lost uh, 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 today among Egyptians, and, and it sort of it becomes almost an Egyptian word. Uh, and often the chant is just bicchia, typically. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, uh, but uh, it probably started, uh, and I don't have exact records of this, uh, but probably in the 19, sometime in the, in the mid to late 19th century. Um, and, 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 it's, and, and it's stuck and it continues. Um, I, I can't really, uh, in a way, uh, place them in a, in a sort of hierarchy. I would say that um, for whatever reason, it's, it's one of the few merchants and, and sellers that uh, um, remain even in, in contemporary Egypt. Um, and, um, and often even uh, in, in some you know, upper middle class areas of Cairo, I, I could hear throughout the day, um, maybe two or three different Bekia sellers. And, and there, you could almost find out sort of a difference in, in their tonality as well. Um, but yeah, it's a fascinating way to sort of look at that and, and, and you almost can go back and trace uh, uh, 19th century Egyptian history. Yeah, I mean, I think there's just such a fascinating um, history of sound in, in Egypt and in Cairo in particular. And, um, you know, thank you for, you know, today bringing that alive to us. Um, and 
Well, it's a, it's a, it's, it's a great book and I, I look forward to reading all of it uh, soon. Um, so thank you everyone. Thank you, Zaid. Thank you to all the Thank you all. Just briefly, can I, um, could, could anyone uh, copy the chats for me and, and email them to me later? Because I'm, you know, if there's any questions or, or references that I can follow, it'd be very useful to me. And, and thank you all for attending and thank you for inviting me. Uh, this, was, this was great. Yeah, I, as, as moderating the, um, the chat, <laughs> it was really great. It was actually quite a job to keep up with everything. So thank you for everyone for contributing to the discussion. Um, and I just want to finish and wrap up and to remind everyone that the next Decolonizing the Lens webinar will be on the 19th of May at 5 p.m. Cairo time again with Lucy Rejofa from the um, Middle East History Department in the University of Birmingham. And she will be talking about 19th century and early 20th century local Egyptian photography. Um, so that will be returning to the visual, um, but that will be a really interesting uh, dis, you know, presentation and discussion. So please join us for that as well. And there will be a subsequent two um, webinars after that. So I hope people can keep going with the series. And again, thank you to all of you and everyone out there um, for contributing and being part of this successful event. <laughs>